No one has more state pride than New Mexicans. The vibrant culture, bold flavors, unique history and dramatic landscapes under our Zia sun are like no other. And the people of New Mexico are a rare breed. As diverse as we are, together we breathe life and soul into this high desert land, a land that promises adventure. I'm Michael Newman, and as your host, I'll be taking you with me as I seek out the best the land of enchantment has to offer. New Mexico makes it feels like home. Thanks for watching another episode of New Mexico True Television. I'm your host, Michael Newman. In this episode, we revisit one of the most monumental chapters of our state's history, the years of the Manhattan Project. From the museums of Los Alamos to the Trinity site where the first atom bomb was tested, we explore the many facets of the atomic age. Just 10 miles south of Socorro and over an hour south of Albuquerque off US 380 East, you will find the Stallion Gate entrance to the White Sands Missile Range, where twice a year, the public is able to visit the Trinity site. When the site is open, it brings people in droves, and understandably so, as the events at this site changed the course of human history. It was in this remote locale where the first atomic bomb was detonated on July 16, 1945, after being scrupulously and arduously developed in Los Alamos as part of the Manhattan Project. After the successful testing of the atom bomb at Trinity, it would go on to be used against Japan during World War II with the hopes of bringing an end to this long, devastating war but also with its unveiling would be the dawn of a new era. Its monumental place in history, along with its limited access, spurs the curiosity of thousands, and twice a year visitors make the pilgrimage to Trinity. This year, I am one of them. It is hard to put into words the feeling you get when standing at ground zero of the detonation site, and no doubt it resonates differently for each person here. Beyond the marker standing in the center of the site, on the two days Trinity opens to the public, Photos are exhibited on the fencing surrounding the perimeter. On site was author and historian Jim Eccles, who was there to answer questions from the crowd and enlighten us on the events of that day in July of 1945. What was it about this location that made it the prime spot for, for the testing? Well, Los Alamos looked at a lot of different sites. Uh, the sand dunes up in Colorado, Catalina Island off the west coast of California, Padre Island in Texas. So a lot of different sites, Gallup and Grants came up the lava field. But this was already under the control of the Alamogordo bombing range. And so they looked at a couple of places here and it had a number of advantages. It was fairly close to Los Alamos. It was already under the control of the government, wide open desert, low population densities, railroad out there to the west, a good highway connecting to Los Alamos. And so in late 44, they decided to come down here and set this site aside as the test site. Okay, so it kind of was a lot of planning beforehand to get right, to that exactly. point. exactly. Okay, and so on that day, you know, can you walk me through what that was like? Who, was, who were the people that were, okay. you know, privileged to be here at that moment in time? You know, the top secret security nobody knew about what was happening here, right? Right. First of all, let's say that the bomb was placed on top of a 100-foot steel tower here and detonated at the top of the tower. The nearest people were at bunkers 10,000 yards to the south, west, and north. The south one was where Oppenheimer was located. Mm -hmm. And it's also where the guys were that threw the switch to trigger the bomb, all the instrumentation, and all those kinds of things. A large group of people, several hundred, were down at base camp, which is 10 miles to the southwest. That's where General Groves watched from. Okay. He couldn't be in the same place as Oppenheimer was if there was anything dangerous going on. Mm -hmm. Are there accounts of what the immediate reaction was? So there's a lot of different uh, points of view from different uh, aspects because of the different locations. Right. And then also the reaction for what they'd done. Right. It worked. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've solved this problem. It's time to move on. And so a lot of these guys immediately take off back to Los Alamos. Many of them head to the Pacific to Tinian, where they're actually going to assemble the bombs to use against Japan. Wow. So there wasn't really a big lapse of time between. No, it I mean happening. it's immediately. Let's move on to the next step. Wow. And the next step is to use it. Okay, that's that's crazy. I mean, imagine being in that that environment and seeing something that has never happened on the face of the planet. Still wrapping my head around all the details Jim just shared with me, I head for the Schmidt McDonald Ranch House. Initially built in 1913 by German immigrant and homesteader Franz Schmidt, the ranch was sold to George McDonald, who lived there with his family from the 1920s until 1942. 
when the McDonald's were forced to vacate the property when it became part of the Almogordo bombing and gunnery range. The home stood abandoned until personnel with the Manhattan Project determined it would be the site for the assembly of the plutonium core of the bomb. Upon entry to the house, you immediately are drawn into the plutonium assembly room. In addition to the informative photographs and articles on exhibit at the house, in walking from room to room, you can't help but notice the aged floorboards, the beautiful but worn stencils and paint on the walls, walls that hold a detailed account of history few of us can fathom. Standing and looking north to the detonation site, I tried to imagine what the people at Trinity experienced that day, the day the world changed forever. Two days a year, Trinity site opens to the public, typically the first Saturday of April and October. This is a free event where no reservations are required. Check the White Sands Missile Range website for details. You may go on your own, but you may want to look into guided tours hosted by organizations or museums like the Los Alamos Historical Museum. Just over an hour and a half north of Albuquerque on New Mexico 502 is the town of Los Alamos. This small and still fairly remote city is remembered by many to be the birthplace of the atom bomb, for it was the headquarters of the top secret Manhattan Project that led to its creation. Los Alamos continues to be a mecca of scientific development and ingenuity, and the Bradbury Science Museum located in the middle of downtown honors the scientific legacy of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. I'm meeting with the laboratory historian Alan Carr at the museum to get more insight into this chapter of Los Alamos' history. At that time, what was it like? You know, you had the Einsteins of the world and the Oppenheimers. How did they come into the, the picture and how did that kind of, that fervency of like, we need to do something now, you know, to stop this war, how did that come to be? When fission was produced in 1938 and interpreted as fission in 1939, that happened in Germany. Oh. And so this was Hitler's Germany. The, the, the Nazis were on the verge of launching World War II. And so this was of significant concern to scientists around the world. So they self-imposed secrecy on fission research. They said, we're not gonna publish this stuff anymore because we don't wanna help the Germans. They may have a lead on us already. And so Albert Einstein, at the urging of a scientist named Leo Szilard, uh, both of them from Axis countries, mm -hmm. Hungary and Germany, right. uh, Szilard urged Einstein to write to President Roosevelt and warning him about what this could possibly mean. That under certain circumstances, you could build an atomic bomb and the Germans have all of the ingredients that they needed to build one. That was our first goal during the Manhattan Project. We have to beat the world. We have to beat Adolf Hitler mm -hmm. to a nuclear weapon. That was the kind of pressure that they were working on early right. on. Switching gears a little bit about where we are right now in the museum. Right. So what kind of um, things were they trying to capture um, about Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project in this place. One of the questions I frequently get asked is why is it, or, or who's Bradbury? People right. have heard of Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, Norris Bradbury, going back to your question, mm -hmm. he was our second director and he was the director from 1945 to 1970. Oh, so wow. for 25 years he was the director. And the wartime laboratory was an anomaly. I mean it was, a, it was just, the, the laboratory itself was built as quickly as possible to build nuclear weapons right. as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. It changed, it was rebuilt, the community was rebuilt. These were all made a permanent community under Norris Bradbury when he, mm -hmm. when he was the director. Here at the museum, you're going to see a lot of World War II displays and exhibits. That is uh, the creation story, if you mm -hmm. will, of our laboratory. That's what it came out of. Right. And I think that's what most people uh, rem remain to be fascinated mm -hmm. with is just the wartime story of the laboratory, the atomic bombs, and New Mexico's unique connection uh, mm -hmm. to that very dangerous time. Mm -hmm. But in addition to all of the World War II displays, you're going to see a lot of exhibits on technology that's been created here at the laboratory since. Oh, right. And so mm -hmm. you'll see satellite technology, modern nuclear weapons stockpile technology, mm -hmm basic science, uh, exhibits on computing. Some mm -hmm. of the world's most powerful computers have been here at Los Alamos throughout the years as well. And I think in looking at all the exhibits, it, it helps folks to realize the laboratory didn't just go away, right. that there have been a lot of things that have been d developed here that have changed all of our lives. To take a step further back in time and in the great outdoors of the Pajarito Plateau, pay a visit to neighboring Bandelier National Monument to explore the ruins of ancestral Pueblo people. But before heading out of town, grab a bite at Blue Window Bistro. Serving up both lunch and dinner, this restaurant has been pleasing locals and travelers alike for over 30 years. Don't go away. Up next, we see what life was like outside the labs. 
Do you need a reason to hit the road? Find out about upcoming events around the state at NewMexico.org. And now from the pages of New Mexico Magazine. The Los Alamos Historical Museum sits in the heart of old downtown Los Alamos, an hour and a half north of Albuquerque off New Mexico State Road 502. The museum is housed in an old log and stone cabin. Originally built as an infirmary in 1918, but ultimately serving as the guest cottage for the Los Alamos Ranch School and guest quarters for officials visiting during the Manhattan Project. While the museum outlines the long span of history in this area, from ancestral pueblos to early homesteaders, I'm here today to get a more personal account of the lives of the people I see depicted in the photos and exhibits of the museum, the people who lived on the plateau during the Manhattan Project. I'm meeting with the museum curator, Amy Slaughter, who, as it turns out, has plenty of stories to share. So Amy, you always hear the story about, you know, what happened here in terms of the science, but I want to know about the people, you know, what, what, what were the people like in starting right where we are right now, so where are we? So we're in the Hans Bethe House, okay. um, is what we call it, because there were a lot of scientists that lived here. Hans Bethe was one of them, Nobel Prize winning scientist. Yeah. And the people that lived here in Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project were very young. The medium age was in the mid-20s. Wow. So very young, um, they worked really hard, they worked six day weeks, and so Saturday Saturday nights, everybody just let loose. There were all sorts of wild parties. Um, there were all sorts of clubs that they made. There were dance groups and music groups and all sorts of things that they did. And uh, it was really a work hard, play hard kind of a place. I imagine. And they were all really aware that they were working on the war effort. And it wasn't just the scientists that were contributing to the war effort. A lot of them brought their families. So there were wives working in town. There were soldiers here. There were people from local communities that were working here. There were local Hispanics and people from local pueblos, all sort of working together to help the United States win the war. Is there like a tense about the people that are working and can't mm -hmm. tell their wives? How does that interaction happen? Yeah, there's a lot of stress because mm -hmm. you can't tell your family what's going on. Um, you can't necessarily even tell everybody that you're working with. It's on a need-to-know basis what, mm -hmm. you can, what you can work about. And you're working, like I said, six day weeks, really long hours. Mm -hmm. So it's really stressful. And there's a lot of stories about, um, especially wives moving here with our scientists saying that they felt like pioneer women, that wow. they left their homes behind and they're living in a city that was built kind of overnight there, all the roads are dirt, there are no street signs, the houses are super temporary. My mail all gets to addressed to post office box 1663 in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have, if, if there are any babies that are born here, that's what it says on their birth certificate. Yeah. They were born in a post office box. Oh. Everybody's driver's licenses said that they live in a post office box. Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. What was in Los Alamos before? There's, you know, you hear about the ranch school. So right. can you talk about that? Right, so there was a boys school here called mm -hmm. the ranch school. And it was a school, it was like a high school age uh, kids that were here, a lot of them were coming from the East Coast or from the Midwest. Um, some of them had health problems, come out in the clean desert air and sort of turn into men. And so they were all also Boy Scouts and they wanted them to not just sort of get their schooling, but also get, you know, learn how to camp and hike and take care of horses. They were all assigned a horse as soon as they came here. So they would learn responsibility. So this was one of the um, houses that one of the masters of the ranch school lived in. There was some infrastructure here because the ranch school was here. So there were over 30 buildings that were here. They had water and electricity. So buildings like this that are, you know, proper houses um, that people could live in and that was kind of where they started from and they thought initially it was going to be kind of a small project but right. it grew very quickly and very large. Wow. And so these houses like the ones that we're in right now, um, the original ones from the ranch school where the masters lived was called bathtub row oh. because uh, <laughs> they were the only houses that had bathtubs because of war rationing. Oh, All of wow. the other houses had showers except for one of the uh, barracks for the wax. They had some bathtubs there. Right. So this is where sort of the big names lived was on Bathtub Row because mm -hmm. they had sort of the social standing to have a proper house with a bathtub. And her stories about people saying like, oh yeah, I'll come and I'll babysit your kids and don't have to worry about paying me. I'll just take a bath while I'm there. <laughs> that was like the luxury. Yes, <laughs> totally. Now that I know the backstory behind the street name Bathtub Row, Amy takes me for a tour of this historic district, which I feel I am seeing with a new set of eyes. While we focus on the Manhattan Project during our visit to the museum, there is a lot more to it. Check out their exhibits on the geology and anthropology of the area. Right on site and just a few steps away from the museum is even an ancestral pueblo. And I'm not the only one able to get a guided tour of Bathtub Row. Three days a week the museum offers docent-led tours of the historic district of Los Alamos. Once you've swallowed such a big dose of history, chase it down with the beer from the Bathtub Row Brewing Co-op. The cleverly named Hoppeheimer IPA seems a fitting choice if I do say so myself. For more great stories like this from New Mexico Magazine, visit NewMexico.org. And now, here's another New Mexico true treasure. 
I'm Juan Bernardes, and I think Carlsbad Caverns National Park is a New Mexico true treasure. There's really nowhere else on earth you can see something like that at, at such a, a grand scale. It, it's, it's amazing because you can see pictures of it, and, and National Geographic magazine has had pictures of Carlsbad Caverns, and when I was a kid I looked at those and was amazed. But when you get there and you see it in person, the scale and the immensity of it, um, it, it's just nothing you can capture in a picture. You have to see it in person to, to truly get it. I have not seen the bat flight. It has been one of the things I've wanted to do ever since I was a kid. Um, just never seemed to make it down. But like I said, you go to Carlsbad Caverns and there's always something new to do. And I think that'll be our next new thing to do. You could spend a lifetime going there and see new things every time. Coming up, the official Atomic Museum of the United States right here in Albuquerque. Do you take a lot of pictures on your New Mexico travels? Well, if you do, show us by hashtagging New Mexico True on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. As we continue our journey into New Mexico's atomic age, we head to Albuquerque for a visit to the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. One of only seven national museums not located in Washington, D.C., this museum in Albuquerque draws visitors each year eager to learn about the Manhattan Project and the dawn of the atomic era. Not to mention get an extreme close-up view of their extensive collection of airplanes, rockets, missiles, and nuclear weapons, the largest collection you can see in the United States. But the nuclear age gave rise to more than just weaponry, from medical applications to atomic pop culture memorabilia. The museum's director, Jim Walther, helps me explore the spectrum of exhibits devoted to the atomic world. So this museum has got a very broad mission to speak about everything nuclear, and that includes, of course, the history of New Mexico, because the nuclear world began here, as we know, just before World War II with the Manhattan Project. And so talking about that age, you know, even nuclear history having a, a designation to a time period in, in, in America called the Atomic Age. So how did that speak to what the culture was like in New Mexico and, and beyond? Well, back at that time, you know, New Mexico was a very rural place. Uh, there weren't very many large cities at all. And when the Manhattan Project came to New Mexico, there were some military installations, but they were much smaller. Mm -hmm. To bring something like this to New Mexico uh, was truly unprecedented. And it was because of the people that were a part of it, people like J. Robert Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. who had spent time in New Mexico as a young person from the East, came out to New Mexico, found it to be not only a beautiful place, but a very isolated place, a place where they could count on no one knowing what was going on because the Manhattan Project was very secret. Right. We have the Trinity site, the place where the bomb was tested in July. And of course, we have some very important material about that too, here in the museum and in this exhibit. This is the Packard Clipper. This is the real car that the scientists rode in. You think about what they spoke about Mm -hmm. in this car, driving back and forth at 25 miles an hour from southern New Mexico to Los Alamos. It must wow. have taken almost all day. A long conversation. Yeah, <laughs> opportunities to talk about how do you make things work, because this was moving from theoretical physics to applied physics. No one had ever done it. Right. And so that brings me to, you know, today, here we are in this museum and so many different artifacts and pieces of material to really get in depth into what you know that whole age was about. So can you kind of give a brief overview of what Certainly. you have in the museum here? There's an exhibit about the 509th, which was the um, Army Air Corps group that dropped the bombs to end World War II. We have those bombs here. We have Those are concurrent copies. They're not reproductions made later. Mm -hmm. So Fat Man and Little Boy, the two first atomic weapons ever created, the only two ever used, in fact. Mm -hmm. And they're real here because they're from that age. We have the only gadget. The gadget was the inside of one of those bombs, and it was what was tested at Trinity Site. And we have the only one of those that's not a reproduction. There's also the Plymouth. This was the first car they used to move atomic material. It was just a Plymouth. Mm -hmm. And they stuck the plutonium in a box and put it on a back seat and drove it from Los Alamos to the Trinity site. Very interesting stories. Mm -hmm. And then as this exhibit moves on, you learn about how did we move into the Cold War and how did we go from having the Soviet Union as an ally mm -hmm. at the end of World War II to a mortal enemy only four years yeah. later. You know, the world yeah. still is, uh, uh, confronted with some of these issues, as we know, from reading our news and seeing what's going on, there 
it's still very topical. Right, it's, it's still relevant. Yeah. After delving into some of the backstories of the items housed in the museum, Jim gives me a personal tour of the exhibits. And so I think most people think atomic, they always think of the bomb, but there's so many other applications of atomic energy that have been used. And you guys have a whole bunch of things on display here. That's right. Mm -hmm. Nuclear medicine is the largest place where Americans and people get a connection to atomic energy or nuclear power. We have some very old x-ray equipment, and oh, x-ray wow. is a type of radiation. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's included here in the museum. So some very old x-ray machines and fluoroscopes and products that uh, were part of the pre-World War I time. Mm -hmm. From tales of quackery to missile accidents, Jim enlightened me on nearly every object within the museum, bringing each one to life. I am certainly walking away with a head full of knowledge I did not have before. Thank you for coming along with us on this walk back in time to learn about the people and places that played a pivotal role in our history. And hopefully this glimpse into the past inspires your future travel. And with that being said, what are you doing next weekend?